All right, uh, I'm going to start a series uh, today, uh, probably a short series, but it's, it's going to be dealing with stewardship. Uh, as we uh, think about the new year and entering into a new year, I want to uh, challenge us on, on stewardship. And as we uh, think about that, you know, what does that mean? And so I want to read a couple uh, verses to you because when we think about uh, stewardship, uh, I want to start the message today and then uh, on the subsequent uh, messages, we want to look at uh, the three T's, the time, the talent, and the treasure. Uh, but uh, to lay a groundwork to that, uh, I just want to begin with the, the thought of this series, and that is what we do here matters. No, no matter how young or how old you are, what we do here matters. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. What we do here matters. And so, you know, a lot of people are just living for today. You know, they want to know what's in it for today. And they really don't think about uh, there comes a day when all of us are going to have to stand before the Lord. And we're going to have to give an account of this life that we've lived here. And some people will, as, as Christians, will give an account of their life as one who has squandered their opportunities, one who has squandered their time living it upon themselves. Verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So we're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ in a little bit. But every believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of their life. And then look at Revelation. Uh, let me get there. I didn't look it up and put it down, uh, but I, I'll get there for you. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And it's speaking of the saints that endured the tribulation of Revelation. And it says in verse 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, watch this now, watch this, and their works, and their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. My brothers and sisters, the scripture is very clear. What you do down here matters in eternity. Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you, Lord, for the word of God, because as we look around, uh, we see many people who started out last year with us that are not here and they have gone on to their eternal reward. Lord, and many of them have thought at some point that I got forever or well, I got 10 years, I got 15 years, I got 20 years. And Lord, the knock came on their door that called them from this life. And Lord, there was not one more prayer they could pray, not one more Bible verse they could read, not more, one more soul they could witness to. But Lord, their work on earth was finished. And so Lord, let us, as the Apostle Paul said, work the work while it's yet day, because the night cometh when no man can work. And so all of us sitting here today, Lord, will hear this message and we will come to the conclusion that we are going to use our life in service to God or we are going to use it to pour upon our selfish means and desires. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just guide and direct us as we get into your word today. And we invite the congregation to come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table anytime. He who fed the multitudes and turned the water into wine, come and dine. The master's calling, come and dine. Feed us, Lord, at your table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. What two powerful verses that we have read. Second Corinthians, that lets us know we're going to stand before Christ and give an account of our life. And then we see in Revelation that the, the, the saints of Revelation, that they uh, went 
to their eternal reward in heaven. And notice what it said. Their works follow them. Their works follow them throughout all eternity. And, you know, so it, it, it behooves us to make sure that, that we are doing the things that uh, God has called us to do. And that we haven't, as I heard uh, one uh, example given, put our ladders against the wrong house. You know, there was a, uh, a man who was going to put a roof on a house and he drove up in his truck and there was some vicious dogs in the yard. And uh, he tried all that he could to calm the dogs, but the dogs wouldn't get calm. And, and so, you know, he stood out there trying to figure out how to get his ladder to put it on the house so that he could go up and begin to work on the roof. Uh, he got lured the dogs away. The dogs uh, went away to another side of the yard. He came in real quick and climbed up the ladder. And just as he started to climb the ladders, one of the dogs dipped at his heel. And he went through all that trouble and got to the top of the ladder and looked at the roof and found out there was a brand new roof on the house. And so what happened? He put his ladder against the wrong house. And I wonder how many Christians that you, you said that this is what uh, I'm going to do and you haven't sought God on that. It's, it's kind of been a unilateral decision of what you said that you were going to do. And, and, and when you get to eternity and you stand before the Lord and, and I, I would to God that this would not be the case for you, but you put your ladder against the wrong house. And that's going to be a sad day. Yeah, we're going to be saved, and, and I'm going to show you that here in a second. Yeah, we're going to go to heaven, but we're going to find out that we didn't spend time doing the things that God would have us to do. If you go to that next slide. So over this series, this mini-series, What We Do Here Matters uh, on Stewardship, uh, we're going to see that God has given to every believer time. Psalm 39, verses 4 and 5. God has given to everyone, especially his children, time. You know, everybody has 24 hours in a day. You know, you talk to people and they say, well, I'm so busy that, you know, I can't get this done. I can't get that done. Then you talk to somebody else and you see them just doing so much for not only God, but, but, but they're accomplishing many things. And you sit, stop back and think and you say to yourself, wow, you know, all of us have 24 hours in a day. That, that, you know, I don't have any more minutes in the day than you have. And so we need to realize that, that God has given us time. And, and, and watch this now, that uh, one day we're going to stand before him and he's going to hold us accountable for our time. What did you do with your time? Did you just spend your time, you know, uh, squandering it, you know, with a bunch, bunch of uh, things that had no meaning in it, the things that were empty? Or did you fill your time with those things that, that bring honor and glory to the Lord? So we're going to look at one message just dealing with time, you know, as, as believers. Look, look, look at this real quick. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians uh, chapter 4. Uh, verse 1. Uh, let, uh, let a man so account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. What is a steward? A steward is someone who had who has been entrusted with the possessions of another. A steward is someone who has been entrusted with the possessions of another. And so when we look back and we see that God has entrusted us with time, he has entrusted us with talents, he has entrusted us with treasures, and he has entrusted us with spiritual gifts. So all of us have 24 hours in a day. The second thing that we see that God has entrusted us with talents. He has given us talents. Now, notice I make a distinction between talents and, and spiritual gifts because talents are natural abilities. 
In Exodus 31, uh, we see uh, two gentlemen, uh, Oholiab and Bezalel, and these individuals were skilled, the Bible says, with uh, craftsmanship, and that when they began to construct the tabernacle, that God had anointed them with natural abilities to be able to assist in the construction of the tabernacle. And so not only does God give us uh, natural abilities and natural talents, uh, but he also gives us spiritual gifts. And again, you know, I'm, I'm going to break all of these down and we're going to get into each one in detail. Uh, now, so all of us have natural abilities. You know, some people can sing. You know, some people are good with numbers. Uh, you know, some people uh, have the, the ability to do art with their hands and crafts and things like that. Well, those are natural abilities. And, and we can use those natural abilities in the kingdom of God. You know, God, get, and, and really, you know, whether you are saved or not saved, you know, natural abilities come from God. That God gifts people to be able to do uh, certain things. And then that dreaded, dreaded message that I'm going to hate to preach, uh, but I'm going to preach it uh, so that you can, you cannot accuse Pastor Glaze of never preaching a message on money, right? That, that dreaded, dreaded message on the, uh, the treasures. So, you know, I, I, I tell this story every time that I, I talk about this, you know, the person that says, you know, because I preach it on, on, on giving maybe uh, once or twice a year, you know, and I thank God for our, our leadership because they make sure that, you know, uh, it's, it's before the people, uh, the things that we need to be given to, because, you know, I, I just don't want to stand up here and, and beat people over the head about money. I'll just be honest with you. You know, I, th this is my philosophy, right? So you can mark this down. This is my philosophy. I believe that if God got your heart, he got your pocketbook, all right? So I'm going to preach to your heart. Uh, but there comes that time, you know, where people say, you know, Pastor, every time I come to church, you're talking about money. Well, you must only come <laughs> once or twice a year. <laughs> if you come, every time you come that I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, again, these are things that God has given us. Uh, Deuteronomy, let's look at Deuteronomy 8, 18, real quick. Deuteronomy 8, 8, verse 18. Deuteronomy 8, 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he who giveth thee power to get wealth. It's God who gives you the power to get wealth. Somebody said, well, you know, I, I, I go out every day and I work on my job and I earn the money that I get. And, you know, God doesn't have anything to do with that. Well, you know, how, how many people are laid out, you know, in their bed or in a hospital somewhere and they have no ability, you know, to earn any income? And we need to realize that the fact that you got up this morning, that God gave you the strength to get up. And you went out and you spent eight hours or however long it was working, and God was the one who sustained you and helped you. In Acts we read, it says, in him we live and move and have our being. So we realize that, you know, our treasures, come from God. I mean, you, we, we can say that, you know, we got all kind of ability to do this and do that, but I don't know about you, but I recognize my source and my source is God. You know, I'm not my source because, you know, I, I could be here today and gone tomorrow, yeah. right? Uh, but God is my source. And I've, I don't know how many people that I've talked to that have been uh, without employment and they have seen God as their source. And if God is your source, the Bible says, I've been young and I've been old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor seed begging bread. Oh, man, I'm preaching better than y'all shouting amen, but that's okay. <laughs> amen. Uh, God has, so, so let's ruminate on this now. Let's ruminate on this, that God has given us time, talent, treasures, and spiritual gifts. God gave them to us. All right. And he's going to hold us accountable when we stand before him. Now, uh, let me do this real quick and, and talk about the threefold judgment of the believer. 
because I believe this is important. The free, threefold judgment of the believer. So we're going to look at this. We're going to say uh, time, position, judgment, place, and the judge. Uh, the time in the past. All of us uh, have a past. All right. And uh, before you came to Christ. Now, I realize some people grew up and, you know, knowing the Lord in the church. So we praise God for that. You know, we praise God for that. But some of us have a, a past. Uh, and that past or in that position, we were what? We were sinners. Right. Our past was sinners. And what did God do? Now, stay with me because I'm going somewhere with this. All right. Uh, what did God do? He took our sins and he judged our sins where? At Calvary. At Calvary. All right. And, and the judge there was the father. So, so look at that. In the past, you know, you were a sinner. And your sins were judged. All of your sins were judged. Not only your past sins were judged at Calvary, but all of your sins. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. That the time was the past. My position was a sinner. My sins were judged. The place was Calvary, and the Father was my judge. Amen. The second thing that we see is the present. So we're moving from the prayer past, and we're moving to the present. So in the present, I'm being what? My position is a son. In the past, I was a sinner. In the present now, I'm a son. And what's being judged? My life. Every day, my life is judged. And where's the place that my life is judged? In the prayer closet. In the prayer closet. Every day, I should be coming to the Lord and, 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 and saying a couple things. You know, the choir sang about this morning, right? I, I give myself. I give myself away. That when we come to the prayer closet, we are coming as a son slash daughter, child of God. And every day when you come, that the place is the prayer closet and your life is judged. Lord, uh, please forgive me for the wrong thing I said. Please forgive me for the wrong thing that I've done. Lord, please help me to live today in such a way that you would be glorified. Help me to live my life today, Lord, so that I can do your will so when I'm in my prayer closet, what is being judged in my prayer closet is my life. That as a son, my life is being judged. And, and who is the judge there? I'm the judge and the Holy Spirit, right? Me and the Holy Spirit get alone and we begin to examine my life and we begin to look at my life. And I begin to say, Lord, let me give myself. Let me give myself. Let me give myself away. And, and that's the judgment of my life. And so that's in the present. In the past, I was judged as a, as a sinner. In the present, God looks at me as a child. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, the children of God, even to them that believed on his name. And so in the present, I bring my life every day before the Father and the Holy Spirit. And we go through this process where I want the Lord, if I have sin in my life, Lord, cleanse the sin that's in my life. Lord, if I want to be able to commune with you. Lord, I want to be able to just walk with you. And that's in the present. So let me show you what's ahead of us one day. And that is, if you go to that next slide, in the future. In the past, you were judged as a sinner. In the present, you were judged as a son. But in the future, you're going to be judged as a steward. That you're going to have to give an account of the life that you've lived here on this earth. What is the judgment? Oh, watch this now. I, lo I love this. I love this. Stay with me. Uh, that in the past, uh, my sins were judged. In the present, 
my life is judged. But praise God, in the future, my service will be judged. All right? Uh, now, now, let me say this. That uh, you will never have to give an account for your sin. And once you come to Christ, you'll never have to give an account for your sin again. Now, your sin might affect your service, so in that regard, you may have to give an account. But I mean, as far as your, your sins were concerned, Jesus took all your sins when he died at Calvary, and he, his blood covered all your sins so that when you stand before God in the future, that when you stand before God, that you will not have to give an account for your sin. Now, you will have to give an account for your service. And, your, and, and sin might have affected your service. So in that regards, you will have to give an account of your sin. But when I stand before Christ, I'm going to stand before him. And I'm, he's going to ask me, you know, what I did with my what? Time, talent, treasure, and gift. That's what, that's what he's going to know. What, what did you do with the service that I gave you? So where is this place at? This place is at the judgment seat. And who is the judge there? Uh, there's only one judge at the judgment seat, and that is Jesus Christ. So if we think about it, again, keep this in mind, right? In the past, a sinner, present, a son, in the future, a servant, a steward. Uh, so that's how we are going to be judged. Now let's, let's begin to look at this future. So again, when I, when I start to teach in depth on these time, talent, and treasures, that you know, we're going to understand that one day we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to have to give an account for him. So let's look at a couple of verses uh, here. Uh, we already looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. And let's look at Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. Actually, let's go back to uh, verse 11. Uh, For it is written, uh, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us, Paul says to the church of Rome, every one of us shall give account of himself unto God. Every one of us shall give an account of itself unto God. So uh, if you go to that next slide. Here is what's called the Bema. B-E-M-A. The Bema. And the concept here is uh, there's an elevated platform, and on the platform was a judge. All right? And the judge sat up on the platform and watched those who competed in the race or whatever Olympic activity there was. And uh, one of the jobs of the judge, oh, watch this now, was to uh, make sure that everybody uh, competed lawfully, make sure that they competed according to the rules. You know, Paul talks about this in other places. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 through 27, he talks about that. So he would make sure they competed according to the rules. And uh, after the event, uh, the participants would come and stand before the Bema, and the judge would reward them according to their efforts, their works. And, uh, you know, Paul talked about the fact that they got a wreath, right? Let's, let's, let's look at that. Let's look at that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, that when they stood before this beamer, First Corinthians uh, chapter 9 and verse 24, uh, he says, uh, Know you not that they who run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. So he says, run in the race, that whatever it is, with your time, talent, treasure, and gifts, run in the race. What, what's your gift? What gift has God given? What natural ability has God given you? What, 
What are you doing with your time that God has given you? What are you doing with your treasures that God has given you? What are you doing with your spiritual gift that God has given you? He says, run in a race that you may be rewarded for whatever it is. If you sing in the choir, right? You are using your natural ability, and that might be combined with your spiritual gift if it's in the gift of serving. But uh, you sang this morning, you were running in the race, right? You, you aren't just singing, and I know that you were singing to glorify God. I, I understand that. And, and, and there's, it, that, that should be our sole motive, you know, for singing to glorify God. That should be the purpose that, where our heart is at. You know, if you ushered this morning, you know, your heart should have been to usher unto God. But, but my brothers and sisters, the fact of the matter is, is that you were in a race. You were, uh, uh, thank you for that back there. Amen, corn. All right. Uh, you were in a race. All right. Uh, this building that's going up, you know, everybody that's participating in uh, the, the energy and effort of the building going up, you're in a race. All right. If you taught uh, Sunday school or, or Life Quest this morning, you were in a race. What, whatever service that you render unto the, you are in a race. And he says, run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate. Every man that runs in the race is disciplined. That's what that word temperate means. Is disciplined in all things. Now look, look, look what he says here. Uh, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. So what is he saying there? That uh, at these uh, Isthmian games, where they came and they stood before the Bema seat, uh, they would take a, 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 a wreath made of laurel uh, and plant, and they would weave it into a crown. All right? I'm not going to mess up the plants, Tony, so you don't have to worry about it. All right? Uh, just weave it into a crown, and then they would put it on the person's head. Right? So let me ask you a question. After about a month, what would happen to this? It would wilt. <laughs> it would wilt away. And so it was actually what? A corruptible crown. So Paul says that, that those who run in the Isthmian games, he said that they do it for a corruptible crown. One that's one day going to you know, crumble up. It's going to wilt. It's going to dry. But notice what he says. He says, but you do it for what? An incorruptible. An incorruptible crown. That the crown that you're, that you're running for, that you sang for this morning, that you ushered for this morning, that you shoveled the sidewalk for this morning, that you gave in the offering for this morning, that is an incorruptible crown. I therefore so run, not as in certainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth against the air. He said, I'm not out here shadow boxing. You know, that when, when you sang this morning, you landed some punches. There were some people that said amen. There were some people whose hearts were ministered to. That when you smiled at somebody coming in this morning and that made them feel a little bit better, that that was a, a, a punch that landed, right? That if you taught a lesson this morning and somebody was uh, helped and understood something from the Bible, you went, a payow! That, that, landed a, that landed a punch, right? Paul said, I'm not out here shadow boxing now. He said, I'm not out here just beating against the air. He said, I'm out to land a punch. And, and, and so what, we, what do we need to be doing with our time, talent, treasure, and gifts? We need to be landing punches with them, right? We need to be landing punches. And so look, he says in verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, right? That, that means discipline. You know, I keep under my body. In the, the, the Greek, it literally means that I, 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 I punch myself, well, figuratively, I punch myself under the eye, all right? And... So what is he saying? He's saying that, you know, what's in me is, is this spirit, this old man that's in me that wants to come up and wants to do the wrong thing. And so what did Paul say? He said, I discipline myself. And every day I got to what? I got to beat that old rascal down, right? I, I got I to keep it from telling me what to do. And I got to tell it what to do. Why? Because what? What I do here matters in eternity what i do here paul realized that what i do here matters in eternity 
And, and, and notice how he concluded this precopy. He says, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I, be said, I, I should myself become a castaway. And that word castaway doesn't mean that he's going to be put out on a desert island somewhere. But you know what it means? He, it means to be unapproved. That after I've done all this, and then I, 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 I fail to exercise discipline, that I myself will be a castaway. I will be unapproved, a dokimazo. That my life, when I stand before Christ, that yeah, I'll be saved. Yeah, I'll stand before Christ saved, but I will actually have lived a life that's in the end, that's not approved before God. Paul realized what we do here matters. Let me uh, wind down with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verses 11 through 13. What we do here matters in eternity. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what he's saying here, that the foundation of life is Jesus Christ. The foundation of your spiritual life is Jesus Christ. That when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you laid the right foundation. That was the right foundation. And now you got something to build on. You know, if anybody, you can go out and do all kinds of good works. You can give millions of dollars to, you know, save the whales, and you can, you know, give uh, millions of dollars to this, and you can go out and serve all that, but you're doing it all on the wrong foundation. Yeah, it's a good thing to have uh, philanthropists in our country and in our world. We thank God for the philanthropists, and, and they do good work. I'm going to say that, but let me say this. It's the wrong foundation. It's the wrong foundation. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, uh, what foundation? Jesus Christ. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble. All right, so th th there's different things that you can build upon. You're a Christian, right? You're a Christian. You got the right foundation. Now, you're in this ministry, or you're serving in this capacity. Now, as you serve, as you live your life, You're either doing it with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble. That's what you're building with upon this foundation. Every man's work shall be made manifest. All right, so it's going to be revealed, right? Right. If, if you're building with gold, silver, precious stone, that's going to be revealed. If you're building, building with wood, hay, or stubble, it's going to be revealed. Every man's shall, uh, work shall be manifest. For the day shall declare it. It shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is. And if any man's work abide which he hath built upon, he shall receive a reward. Wait a minute, Pastor Glaze. I'm just, I'm just serving because I love God. I, I, I love God, and I just want to serve God. That's great. And keep that motive. Don't let that motive ever leave your heart. Let that be in the center of everything that you do. But realize that as you serve God with all your heart and as you serve God out of, out of pure love, that the Bible says right here, Pastor Glaze didn't put this in. No, this is what the Bible says, that you shall receive a reward. Okay, you shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved at us by fire. And, and, and notice that uh, it says he shall be saved, uh, and, and it says yet as by fire, actually the Greek, it says uh, through the fire. So that means that you're not, you're, your salvation is not going to burn up, that when you stand before the beam of seat of Christ, that your salvation is not going to burn up, but what's going to burn up? Your works. If they, if they have been done, in a shady way. All right. So uh, what we do will follow us. If you go to that next slide. What we do will follow us. Our works and deeds will be tested by fire. Now, you know, I don't want to get into a debate back and forth. 
Is there going to be a literal fire? You know, are, 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 works, are, are there going to be literal works and there going to be a literal fire? Okay. Well, this is what the Bible says. And I know a lot of people take that figuratively. And, but let's put it this way. Whether you take it literally or whether you take it figuratively, watch this. It's the same result. <laughs> it's the same result. So however you want to take it, as you sit there today, you take it how you will, but it's the same result. That uh, some way God, God got some way of, of looking at our works and testing them and to see whether or not they are genuine. And that uh, as we read in Revelation about the tribulation saints, that their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. Now, there's a quote, and I'm, I'm going to, uh, I got one more slide after this, but I'm going to end this uh, after, before I show this last slide and say something about this slide. And, uh, and that is a quote by John MacArthur. Uh, now, I don't agree with everything John MacArthur says, but, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, I feel that he hits it right. So he was commenting on this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and he says this. He said, we build. So it says what? The right foundation, Jesus Christ. You build upon it, wood, hay, stubble, uh, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble. All right? He said, we build by our motives. Why do we do a thing as important as, as what we are doing? All right? Why we're doing it is, is even as important as what we're doing. A campaign of neighborhood visitation done because of the compulsion is wood. Because somebody compulsed you to do it. You, you, it wasn't in your heart to do it, but you just went and did it because somebody, you know, made you, sh shamed you made you feel bad. And so you went and did it uh, because of that, but it wasn't in your heart to do it. And even while you were doing it, you know, you didn't put your heart into it. He says, that's wood. But visiting the same people in love to win them to the Lord is gold. Mm -hmm. Singing a solo in church and being concerned about how the people like our voice is hey is hey but singing to glorify the lord is silver giving generously out of duty or pressure from men is strong but giving generously with joy to extend the gospel and to serve others in the name in the lord's name is a precious stone work that on the outside looks like gold to us may be hay in God's eyes. He knows the motives of men's heart. That whenever you do something, that God knows your heart, and he knows what heart you're doing it out of. And so as we go through this series on the time, talent, and treasure, you know, we want to get you to line your heart up with your action, and that your heart would be out of a love for God, out of a desire to see uh, ministry go forth. You know, even as you look at spiritual gifts, you know, somebody says that, you know, spiritual gifts, you know, I, I use my spiritual gift to help me do this or help me do that. No, if you look at spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts are for one thing, and they're for the others. You can't find a spiritual gift that's for self. I mean, in its true essence, every spiritual gift is to benefit somebody else. So if, I'm, if I've got a spiritual gift and I'm using it to benefit myself, you can mark it down. You can mark it down. That's wood, hay, or stone. Because every spiritual gift is to benefit the body of Christ. And I'll sit down with you and we can go through the, the spiritual gifts and I can show you from the word of God where spiritual gifts are for others and not for you. And I know, and I know some people don't agree with that. now, But uh, let's be biblical. You know, we Bethany... Uh, we we can already change our name to Bethany uh, Bible Baptist. No, just kidding. <laughs> All right, you know, let's be biblical now, and uh, and realize that if we have a gift, it's not for us. It's to be utilized in the body of Christ. All right, and so what we do now, what we do now, matters in eternity. So if you go to that last one, and I'm done. Where will you be on Judgment Day? So again, whether we take these literally or figuratively, 
you know, the reality is, is probably more significant than the picture. All right? The reality is more significant than the picture. Will you be at the judgment seat of Christ? And, and I, I got into a discussion with somebody that didn't agree with me on this. Uh, but again, let's sit down and let's be biblical. The fact is, is that if you are a Christian, this is the only judgment that you'll be at in the future. The great white throne judgment is for unbelievers. It's for people that don't know Christ. So I've heard Christians say, well, I just hope that I'm right when I stand at the great white throne. <laughs> no, I, I don't want to be at the great white throne. You know, I'm not going to be at the great white throne. I'm going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, where I'm going to give an account as a servant, as a steward, right? People who stand at the judgment seat of Christ, I mean, the, the great white throne, they give an account as sinners. See, they have never given an account for their sin. Our sin has been accounted for at Calvary. Amen. I thought I'd get a louder amen than that. Amen. All right. Amen. Our sins have been accounted for at Calvary. Right. And, and so we we don't have to be at the other one because the great white throne. That's where people are going to give account for their sin. So if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, you will stand at the beam of seat and give an account. And so when you give an account, it will be as a steward for your time, talent, treasure and spiritual gifts. Father, we come to you today and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to come into 2018 and talk about stewardship and Lord you have made each and every one of us stewards and what is a steward a steward is someone who has been entrusted with the possessions of another and Lord you have entrusted us with these things that we talked about this morning and that we're going to get into in more detail in the next couple of weeks and so father we pray that you would touch our hearts as, and I pray today that everybody here is a steward. That's my prayer, is that everybody here today is a steward and that we are going to give an account of our stewardship. But there might be somebody here who has never received Christ as their Lord and Savior. And one day they're going to stand at the great white throne judgment and give an account as a sinner. But they don't have to because they can change that today if they would come and give their heart to Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that you would guide and direct this invitation as we commit it to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.